And I didn't bring any slides or also didn't write a paper. Um, I'm, I think, like what Norm referred to the rational and, and cross-dimensional. So as the first attempt, what I would like to try is to actually read them in together. And for that, I have brought a um, time-controlling or actually time-producing device that is a metronome. Or like a time, actually, which I would use as a metronome. And I will um, ambush you with a kind of non-offensive per performance, participatory performance, that no one has to participate in. But I really would like to breathe with you together, to be honest. And um, arriving here, uh, or actually starting kind of site-specific projects that have to do with a particular place, with very concrete people and with very concrete issues, um, we often bring our visions, intentions, motivations, we try to kind of uh, sort it out in the form of uh, collaboration together, but very often I find that um, kind of a question where we're coming from is um, a little bit missing or is kind of a little bit overseen. So in that sense, um, I have put this uh, metronome to buzz and peep um, every five minutes, which is also time this talk that uh, has started a little bit uh, postponed. And each time it peeps and buzzes, if you can hear it, I would like you to just take a breath, to check in, to tune in, to look around, to arrive, and take it from there. If you don't like to participate, try not to take a breath, but I definitely recommend not to, not to do it for too long. So I'm not sure whether it's really functioning in terms of hearing, but it's an issue of tuning in. So let's, let's try to hear. This is the first thing I wanted to do. The second thing I wanted to do is to kind of bring you to a couple of places and to contextualize my practice also site specifically when I talk about listening, radio, and uh, the specificity of practice. And uh, instead of a PowerPoint presentation, I have uh, constructed a little party tour that uh, looks as chaotic as it is, and I will navigate it uh, with you all together. But uh, to start off, I actually would like to introduce you to a person that, uh, spoiler alert, some of you uh, have met this person already, that is quite instrumental um, for my practice, namely my grandfather. And with this, uh, I will talk, speak over it, so the subtitles and uh, you can uh, look into this as if you travel on a train. So uh, this is a place in Kherson, South Ukraine. And it is, uh, in many different ways, very similar, but also very different to place I'm, uh, we are right now. Similar in a way that it also used to be a swamp and kind of a series of lakes uh, that was called Quarantine Island. That was a place where uh, people who died on uh, malaria were buried. And also some people who died on plague uh, that was also sometimes common in South Ukraine. And um, at some point, a sand from the river was brought onto it. And um, as a quartiers for workers from a shipyard, it was be built with uh, huge concrete buildings that are very common um, kind of image for Eastern Europe and something that in one another way you also encounter here. And why I'm talking about my grandfather and radio and my practice as well is because my grandfather happened to be a radio operator in the Second World War. And how it happened is that um, as the war with fascism has started, uh, with fascism with uh, Germany, back then with fascist, fascist Germany, um, he really wanted to go to war, get a rifle, and uh, get engaged into struggle, but uh, he wasn't old enough. So in order to volunteer to the front, he has forged his age, he has pretended he's, he's older, as many people did back then, and went to the front, so he successfully volunteered. But what he didn't take into account is that um, he really looked very small. He was small, he was a kid, basically, 16 years old. So instead of a rifle to shoot someone, uh, what he was given was kind of a reference to his agility and size. And he was given a field radio station. So with this radio station, he was always sent kind of beyond the boundaries of uh, friendly forces to spy on the enemy and to use the radio as a kind of you know, strategic tool, much more than a uh, home kind of device entertainment system. So he used the radio. Oh, yeah. Let me keep it on as a reminder of uh, new media. Uh, exactly. Um, Nice, I will use this reference as well. Very often when we speak about radio, we kind of refer to that as an old media. But uh, what in, U in Europe, kind of especially, or in the West, gets lost quite a lot is that radio still remains a medium of emergency. Uh, not just emergency, like as a, for instance, good guitar, if this was to happen, 
a TV station, radio station were the first one basically to occupy, but also if a natural disaster happens and there is no Twitter and internet, radio is a direct uh, medium of communication. So long story short, um, as I was growing up in uh, this very room, uh, surrounded by many, many radios of my grandfather, um, I was kind of encountering different types of struggles that had to do with the context of collapse of the Soviet Union and the uh, introduction of the free market economy into a post-Soviet space. And this was also followed up by uh, many different conflicts, uh, just to name a couple from the 90s. Uh, these are two wars in Abkhazia, two wars in Georgia, three wars in Chechnya, Tajikistan, Transnistria, and a war in Uzbekistan, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. So growing up surrounded by this many radios, radio for me was never kind of a medium of entertainment or something that was sending um, out kind of just nice music, but was always a device that was uh, inevitably intertwined with the questions of struggle, with the questions of conflict, and with the questions of direct action. So basically, um, how do you deal with um, different situations of emergency? Maybe I move on to the party tour, let's see what happens. And um, in that sense, there were many things that uh, we were kind of speaking with my grandfather about in regards to what is very often referred to as a radio broadcast and um, the notion of transmission, namely that radio in itself, when you think about this, very often, when you think about narrowcast, operates from an enclosed studio with a very articulated voice uh, that knows what to say and uh, talk, talks about the um, recent political events. And um, it doesn't have a really, um, oh wait, Three seconds left. Cool, thank you. You could hear it as well, is it? Or should I pay attention? Okay, pay attention. Um, so in a way, uh, when we th think about the radio broadcast, it is indeed an enclosed studio in which uh, something is being sent out. Uh, it is something that has to do with the humongous infrastructure that uh, originally in the history of radio, of course, comes from military and the state, and something people don't have access to. So it is um, an infrastructure that is uh, not really democratized and accessible. In the history of radio, though, uh, the radio was used to punctuate space. Namely, um, I will talk about this uh, image in a bit. Namely, when you think, uh, let's say, 100 years ago, pretty much exact, Radio wasn't in your house. Radio was uh, very often just a big pole with a speaker that was standing next to the church and was used as a gathering point um, to which people came also in a particular rhythm to listen to the voice uh, that was coming from above. And if you think back to that, um, it is also uh, not just the voice that you hear without the body. It's one of the first time you actually hear the voice without the body, especially if you were not from the class that could uh, afford a gramophone, let's say. So uh, radio has this kind of uh, very ritualistic, uh, McLuhan writes about this of course as a tribal drum, kind of a very natural, um, tribalistic notion uh, of presence. And at the same time uh, it also is used to gather people uh, in public spaces. This project I'm showing here is um, also dealing with the punctuation of the rhythm of a city and uh, that is uh, an open radio, uh, uh, radio station. Um, which I'm developing within of my practice and I refer to as a radio narrowcast. So when you think of radio broadcast as a kind of closed space um, of manipulation and editing of voice, of manipulation, manipulation and editing, editing of content, then radio narrowcast uh, and open radio studio is a kind of a much more ambiguous format in which it is not entirely clear who is sending, who is listening, who is participating in it, and so on and so on and so on. And what that allows to do, that allows to shift attention from radio, as we refer to that within of entertainment or news industry, towards the very basic question of transmission. Namely, who transmits what to who, by what means is it transmitted, why is it being transmitted, and so on and so on and so on. So in that sense, you can think of radio not just as a tool to interrupt space, but also as a uh, strategic instrument that deals with different agencies existing in a particular, uh, on a particular site. So, um, in this work I was invited in downtown Kingston, um, it is in Jamaica, to um, actually respond uh, to a particular issue that is happening on site within uh, the artistic residency, which back then was identified by people who take part on the program as um, like high level of violence, basically, with the saying that if you don't hear a gunshot in the morning, you hear a gunshot in the, in the evening. And uh, one of the issues that was risen is that um, the public space wasn't safe to enter. And for that reason, uh, we have started like a series of 
um, interruptions uh, of this situation in public space, namely a series of open radio shows, radio interventions, if you like, to which we invited the others by the means of radio, not to create content, but to basically um, experience and address public space in a different manner. There, the radios were also not used to, again, just broadcast and hear it in a kind of distanced way, but indeed, in a sense of media theory, as a kind of a drum that brings people together. Also, very pragmatically, we uh, didn't have speakers, so uh, we've been asking people to bring their radios with them, uh, which uh, in return created kind of a sense of amplification and a sense of loudness um, that also allows many theorists to actually speak about humans as a form of sound or as a sound body um, that we've been looking into together. Um, all right, Why, how is this happening? Whoa, jumping around. So, um, okay, these are some radio shows. So these um, radios um, also started kind of combining not only the uh, not only the pragmatics of the issues that we've been dealing at stake, but also we've been asking for kind of an aesthetic form that could develop from there. In this particular situation, uh, this radio is merged into a radio sound system that is still operating in Kingston, Jamaica, and um, operates in kind of educational and radio interventionist format. So it is a sound system that everyone can um, lend, uh, borrow in the Studio 174. This is the residency space and bring it to your own street and create this kind of radio intervention that again uh, proposes different rhythms, interactions and so on. The um, idea of the mobility and the openness uh, in public space also kind of moved into uh, creation of uh, different mobile sound systems that... Oh wait, three seconds left, are you ready? It's really good. Really like really. Um, so in a way, when we think about this radio, uh, about radio in general, not as an entertainment system, but as something that combines, uh, on the one hand, questions of access, infrastructure, privilege and strategy, and on the other hand, something that um, deals with the, um, yeah, of course, artistic questions and questions of aesthetics, um, it poses the question of how the radio can be used in different contexts that allow access for people that are usually, let's say, excluded or marginalized uh, from cultural knowledge, cre knowledge creation processes. Um, this is a project that was uh, developed within uh, Berlin Biennial that is happening right now, and it was developed together with the elderly resource centers, um, with people who are one of um, the ladies who takes part, she's 101 years old um, and um, really keen addressing the issues of fascism that, uh, again, in a very particular way, I won't have time to go into this uh, much, intertwined with the technology of radio and um, with the notion of voice and access. But um, here we have created this kind of little uh, radio station that um, kind of addresses the questions of presence of elderly in public space that again uh, deals with the questions of access and the questions of taking part in kind of decision-taking uh, processes within a particular uh, public environment. So uh, that merged also many in different interactions and performances that unfolded in public space and that again kind of functioned in this very purposefully very ambiguous um, zone. Um, maybe I also speak about radio and ambiguity a little bit because um, very often there is a kind of confusion I find between the vagueness, uh, namely something is just not clear, and ambiguity, that is uh, kind of just mm, a lot of different meanings to the same thing. And um, being an artist and working with the notion of ambiguity for me is quite important because um, on the one hand um, I have to decentralize myself from, uh, let's say, artistic process, so I have to create space that is not contaminated by my artistic vision, you know, so very often we, like, we still live kind of in this epoch where you know, artists say, okay, you know, this is, this is me, this is how I think it. And I have spoken about this with the museum and all the curators necessary and we will build it. So uh, in this ambiguity one creates kind of um, a decentralized approach to production of an aesthetic vision that comes from a very particular kind of concrete problem. Speaking about concrete and um, let me see if I close this, what else do you have? Speaking about concrete, uh, there is a very um, important uh, notion that kind of for me resonated quite uh, very much with the fluid rhythms and that is rooted um, in the Fevre, namely the uh, notion of concrete listening. And the notion of concrete listening I do not derive from Musique Concrete, uh, that was of course an amazing avant-garde movement of uh, the 60s and 70s and is still very present in our life, 
but from architectural and urban theory of Henry Lefebvre, who pointed out that pretty much any practice has to be focused on concrete problems and has to be um, solution-oriented, purposeful. Uh, at the same time, also, I think in the right of the city, he was pointing out that uh, there are severe limitations to both uh, theory and practice, namely for the theory being theory, being completely detached from kind of everyday presence of events and concrete people, and limitations of practice is, of course, kind of limitations of inability of, of articulation, of inability to articulate itself in different registers, whether it's poetry or just kind of um, randomly um, versed words. Wow, one minute left. I hope you're ready. Um, speaking of these concrete issues, um, of course, radio in public space um, takes different shapes. One um, of the works that um, responded to the issue of ownership of space was developed in Athens, in Greece, just in this year, as a collaboration with an artist and activist group from St. Petersburg called Stodielet. Uh, I don't know whether you know them. Um, Rooting in the um, book of Chernyshevsky uh, called uh, Stodielet and then Book of Lenin, that uh, kind of created a nice one of the first DJ remixes uh, in the communist theory. And um, this is a park uh, in the middle of Athens that is uh, belonging to many different peripheries. And the question of this park was who owns the park, whom belongs the park. And for that, uh, one of the things that go from hand in hand together with radio, public space and concrete listening, 14 seconds left, is uh, the notion of listening space. So in that sense, um, radio also becomes kind of a tool to interrupt uh, the flow of the space by creating an ambiguous space of listening in which it is not entirely... Oh. Wow, we are like at 80% of participation. Who is, whoever is hiding the breath, don't do it. Um, so it was um, kind of, not an attempt, but um, an experiment in creating a uh, listening space in a uh, kind of in a large park that was going on the one hand together with this open radio station that was always transmitting and operating on the wave of 100 FM, and with a listening space um, built together with these uh, little um, sonic sculptures, if you like, that were drawing on the uh, military infrastructure that still exists in Athens. Uh, it's populated by many speakers that uh, you know are used for military exercises or for demonstrations. And oh wait, it's very interesting how technology works. And this uh, space, of course, when you think about radio, not as something that creates um, radio-specific content, is much more um, a combination, let's say, between a public program, a learning site, an installation, an interaction, but also kind of an immediacy uh, of the event. So it becomes less about recording and reproducing, recording or manifesting a particular content, but uh, much more about the immediate experience of interaction with each other, something that we are sharing right now. Of course, um, it's very hard to think radio uh, beyond uh, kind of institutional structures and to think agency of listening beyond that. One of the interesting examples for me um, I could talk about goes through a work that was developed in framework of uh, Tate Britain, not Tate Modern, I think this one was. Yeah, this was a, in uh, Tate Modern and it is in the Studio C. I don't know how familiar you are with the space. It's in the main, um, main collection. And it was opened to kind of this installative space with microphones and sounds and imagery. And people were wondering what is it exactly. And what it happened to be was um, a ongoing project that was developed over uh, one year together with the elderly people who live next to Tate and um, who are experiencing like an increasing closure of uh, day centers and kind of in a way complain or feel the urgency, a very important word I think in artistic practice, I uh, feel the urgency uh, to kind of negotiate with state a power relationship and wonder, okay, what, how do we benefit basically from, let's say, opening up the new building or from the increasing prices on South Bank. And uh, for good or bad, or even for both, um, we decided to um, make an ambiguous space of listening in which people have worked with the uh, family archive images and been layering one after another uh, narratives that have to do uh, with the space uh, of South Bank. So we see different forms of engagements, interactions, and uh, sometimes people jumping into this or wondering uh, what does it actually have to do with us and why is it in the main collection. Also many people who run in and say, where, where can we see art? This is um, still a very prevailing question that I will not answer. 
Um, okay, radio of course takes um, different shapes and forms in terms of mobility as well, and there are some drawings that currently being built. Um, projects I'm still uh, developing uh, with elderly that are aiming to, you know, sabotage public space in many different ways. Um, you can see some drawings here. Um, project I was uh, I'm looking into with shipyard workers in my hometown in Ukraine. And uh, this is one of my favorites that definitely will have um, a big future after I have seen these motorized uh, Calypso bikes uh, cruising through Amsterdam. Uh, it definitely quite excites me. And um, I think um, after kind of proposing these different coordinates that deal with urgency, agency, intentionality, listening, breathing and presence, if you like, but also with a specific site, um, I would like to say thank you very much. And um, just want to point out that we have perhaps uh, 30 more seconds uh, for the breath before we go into the questions. Thank you very much.